Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to The Deal Room Podcast, a podcast brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Welcome to part one of an exciting two-part series with serial entrepreneur, and I don't use that term lightly, he really is a serial entrepreneur, Neil Asher, where we dig into a lot of interesting information learned from the coalface by Neil in building and selling multiple businesses, and interestingly, from the time he had spent as a broker. Neil's a fascinating person. He clearly has a love of not just growing businesses, but also of selling them. He's bought and sold tens of businesses, some of which he has built from the ground up to multi-million dollar businesses primed for sale. In addition, he's also spent time as a broker for part of his career, using very unusual but successful strategies to connect buyers and sellers of businesses. In this episode, Neil brings us a wealth of ideas about how not only to identify when a business is ripe for sale, but also about his clever approaches that got him top dollar for his businesses. In this episode, we also drill into the opportunities for M&A advisors in thinking differently. So for businesses that are growing to sell and for M&A advisors and brokers looking for different ideas in how to target a market, this episode offers some great learning for you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real-life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, Jo. Hello, Neil. How are you? Good, thanks. Huh? Let me turn you up for some reason. You sound like you're a bazillion miles away, which is kind of you know, fitting. <laughs> I am, right? <laughs> you are. You are yeah. <laughs> Good to meet you. Nice to meet you too, albeit virtually, but very nice nonetheless. Fabulous. And so what's your, I, I, I couldn't quite work out from um, from the podcast uh, that, that I heard you on, whose podcast? Oh, Alana's podcast. Alana's. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Awesome. Yeah, oh, she is absolutely fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I couldn't quite work out what your main business is now. Like, obviously, you're, um, you, you know, selling stuff. <laughs> And uh, yeah. <laughs> but but you're, are you B two B at all, or are you you're, you're an online marketer effectively? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's it's difficult for me to really work out what I do. Oh, and right. when I'm asked, <laughs> I I usually have a, a different response depending on the situation. I've kind of got my fingers in a few different pies. The thing what Alana's involved with, which is what brought her and I together, is the um, Amazon training company that I run called the Aussie Online Entrepreneurs. Oh, so we've right. got uh, 750 members in that who pay a monthly fee to be a part of that at different levels within that particular organization, depending on the level of service, um, if they're getting one-on-one -on -one coaching and stuff like that. So, so I guess that was the thing that brought Alana and I together because she's a member of that group. She's setting herself up to sell things on Amazon. And, uh, and doing really, really well, as you can imagine. And um, what were you before your um, broking business? I can't remember, did you say you were in recruitment or something? No, um, before, prior to running the, the brokering business, I had a, well, I started a, well, let me go back a little bit. So we had just given birth to my, now his 10-year-old daughter. And so we just given birth to her and she had, you know, beautiful, beautiful little girl. And we got to the point where she was eating solid food and it was all great. And uh, this was in England. And my, my daughter went for a phase where quite literally the only thing that she would eat at all was tomatoes. Oh, that was it. Right. That's all we could get her to eat. <laughs> Wouldn't eat anything else, like just a tomato-aholic. And so, you know, me and my wife were kind of pulling our hair out. I come from a cooking background. So, of course, I was like, no, we'll make this wonderful organic food. And nah, not interested. She'd throw it at us and things like that. And so <laughs> I thought to myself, well, how, how can I get her to eat some, a more balanced diet? And so I went online, as you do, and it's a huge thing. These babies, they don't want to play nice. 
they're, they're, they just want to eat whatever they want to eat, yeah. whatever they want to eat. And so it's a huge thing. And I, and I thought, I saw it online. I thought there are so many people going through the same problem that clearly that's an opportunity. And so I started to work with um, the University of San Diego, which has got a big, great nutrition department over there. And uh, at a company that I had met at a, um, um, like a big trade fair in Switzerland who could put together interesting products uh, for me. And so between the two um, companies, well, the university and the company in America and myself, we put together a chocolate milkshake that was laced surreptitiously with all of these really, really healthy superfoods like wheatgrass powder and uh, broccoli powder and, um, you know, it's lovely, lovely superfoods wow. what you and I would eat. Yep. Awesome. We love it. But it was all hidden beneath the veneer <laughs> of chocolate. Right. <laughs> so, so we put that together. And it's a pretty cool drink, you know. Uh, it had like 13 superfoods, all organic, and it was a great product. And we, you know, we loved it. And my daughter loved it, more importantly. So I was like, fantastic. So we put that together for her, and then we started marketing it in the UK. And we used... <clears throat> Um, a lot of different strategies to market it, but we got to the point where we had 30,000 customers a month buying the product. Wow. So it was going, you know, it was a good product. It's great. And there's a whole raft of other things around that. But one of the things that we did on that was we worked with a big company called Groupon. And you may have heard of Groupon. Yeah. It's like catch of the day here in Oz. But Groupon, we were doing a lot of launches of the product and essentially, our, our product marketing strategy was, you know, we'll, we'll kind of give it away on the front end. Hopefully, they will like it and continue to buy it on the back end. So that was the, the essence of the marketing for that particular company. And, and it worked really, really well. Some people, of course, didn't like it, but the majority did like it. And so we could build the business and have a sustainable business model. Uh, so we did that with Groupon and we would use them to launch this product using Groupon deals and discounts and things like that to find new customers. And we, we ultimately got ourselves into the situation where I wanted to expand the company into, uh, into Spain and into Europe in general, but Spain particularly. Uh, for some reason, lots of Spanish babies don't want to eat their greens either. <laughs> so I saw that as a great opportunity. So I, I approached a Groupon management team and said, hey, look, um, I want to, you know, this is a great way. We've had a good collaboration and it was a really good collaboration. They loved it. Uh, let's launch into Spain. And so we kind of took Groupon and by proxy, uh, it was a product called Kids Five a Day. We took Kids Five a Day into, uh, into Spain as well. And so I, I did that with those guys and ultimately I, I sold that business. And then when I sold it, that's, it was getting really, it was winter and my wife takes the piss out of me relentlessly for this. I do it every time. It was winter in England and it's horrible and cold and, you know, yuck. And uh, I was like, Tash, I, I can't cope with this anymore. I wasn't, I wasn't working. I didn't have a business to focus on. And so I just become insufferable at that point and uh, get under Natasha's feet. And, and so I said, let's, can we, let's go to Australia. And I started telling my friends all about going to Oz and they were like, oh, we'd love to go to Australia. Australia's <laughs> awesome. It's the land of milk and honey. And they loved it, you know. So, and again, I went, oh, well, there's, that's interesting. I wonder how many other people would love to move to Australia. And I started doing my research. And of course, every man and his dog wants to live in Australia. And so that's where the business brokerage was born out of. We, we kind of built that around England being rubbish and Australia being awesome. That was essentially the thrust of the marketing wow the entire thrust of the marketing was england sucks australia is awesome move to australia <laughs> and, and so we built it on that and a lot of our listeners are um you know are, are business brokers but i guess your idea of um a business broking was was quite different in that the market that you were pitching the uh, uh, as the buyers, uh, these um, these people sitting in the UK, you know, sitting on in, on a dark <laughs> dark day where it's raining. I like it. <laughs> yeah, you've got the image. You've got the image. Persisting down with rain. It's cold. They're in their front rooms. Cup of tea. <laughs> there must yeah, they be wouldn't. A they wouldn't way. have any fun. <laughs> right. So yeah, we we um, 
<clears throat> well, it's kind of it's kind of weird. Um, I'm I'm a big believer in educating myself, and uh, and have done for a long, long time. And so um, I had gone to a big marketing seminar and saw a particular guy speak. And um, one of the things that he he spoke about, and it was really just a throwaway comment um, that I just picked up on, was the concept of a what's what he called a grabber something to grab the attention of the recipient of whatever it was you're sending them. Back then, it was direct mail. So, um, so, and it was a throwaway comment, and it was in, within the context of something much bigger. But it, I heard it and went, a grabber. That's exactly what I need. I need a grabber. And so, uh, in Australia, I went to the, the, all, all the currency houses and said to them, I need 5,000 one-pound coins. Now, you would think that's actually quite a simple thing to get, but in actuality, it was actually really difficult to get, one, 5,000 one-pound coins. And uh, back then, the exchange rate, I think, was 2.5 Aussie to a pound. So it was, uh, you know, it was a, it was a significant, it was like $12,500 worth of uh, one-pound coins I needed. And it was a lot. And so we had to just kind of fudge the whole thing together and go to a lot of different places. Then we wrote a big four-page sales letter. And imagine this, okay? So, uh, and on the sales letter, on the very, very first side, we had a one-pound coin on the top right-hand side that we sellotaped on, like in a, in a cross like that, with a pound, cross like that, uh, and then an arrow pointing to it, saying, see that one-pound coin? That's worth... Uh, $2.50 to you. Sell your business to a POM. They've got pounds. They can overpay for your business. And that was really the, <laughs> so the, the marketing thrust, okay? And then we got a list of, we had put together a list of 5,000 businesses that were perfect uh, acquisition targets for this particular thing that we were putting together. And, uh, and sent them this direct mail piece. Wow. And you can imagine that, I mean, our phones rang off the hook. They really did. Because who doesn't like the idea of, of making more money than you ought to do? You know what I mean? Who doesn't like that idea? So it played well. And, and can I ask what sort of businesses, what, what were you targeting as the type of business that you thought, um, you know, was most likely f uh, to be a good sell to um, someone from the UK? You know, what sort of businesses were they looking for? Well, um, all, all we did, and this is, comes to my geeky kind of um, direct marketing and online marketing background, all we did was we looked at the searches um, performed using Google AdWords for various different start a mm, business oh. uh, we looked at them and got the top 10 different searches that were out there so number one well what would you think would be the number one business that most non-business people want to start what do you think their number one is oh gosh i've got absolutely no idea start a um oh yeah i don't know well, surely it would be something that's exciting to do. So sure. I don't know, a uh, surfing business. Sure. That <laughs> would know. be awesome, wouldn't it? <laughs> Particularly if you're going to move to Australia, start your paddleboard and surfing business. I'd have some of that for sure. I get uh, being from the UK, it, it must be recruitment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was cafes. Okay. So the number one right. thing, okay. and if you look at websites like uh, Business for Sale and uh, Places like that, you know, the, the number one business that gets sold is a cafe yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. So by a factor of two or three to one to the next most popular business. And can, can I ask, so, are these searches coming from the UK or they're just general Google searches? Yes, yes, yes. Because remember, you've got to go where your market is. Yeah. You've got to put your, your advertisement in front of your willing recipients of your marketing message hopefully they're willing anyway uh so we've put the we put the marketing in front of those people and uh yeah so we we approached the majority of the business we approached were cafes as a result of that and the thing with cafes is it is a very very seemingly 
glamorous business. You know, are you going to get to make coffees all day? You'll hang out with your friends. And that's really the interpretation that most folks have of restaurants and cafes and things like that. But the reality of a business like that is that it's actually incredibly hard work. Cafe owners, restaurateurs work ludicrously hard within their businesses for not a great deal of reward at the end of it. And, and they quickly figure out it's not very glamorous. So a letter from from us saying, hey, we can get you out of your cafe and we can get you more money than you really ought to get for it because you're going to sell it to somebody with pounds instead of dollars was like manna from heaven for them. And they just ate it up. Our our phones rang off the hook without a doubt. Uh, And then in England, what we would do is we put together a, um, we would advertise on Google AdWords for people that were searching for information about leaving the UK or moving to Australia or buying a cafe or whatever it might be. But also things, weird things like we saw that um, people who reached a certain age in life, usually when their kids had left home, were also interested in then, okay, well, now the kids left home, let's go on and go and live our own dreams again. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time marketing to those people too. And of course, every, every individual person that you market to or individual faction of a group of people, you market to them differently and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 was, it, was, a, it was a very, very successful endeavor. We sold, we had 11 business brokers. We sold $47 million worth of businesses wow. in our second year. Um, and then I, I sold the company to somebody else who was the market leader but then who wanted to get into that particular space, which is the business skills visa. Uh, but then it was called, I don't know what it's called now, uh, business skills visa. And it was all about, you know, Australia wanting to get people who spent over uh, $250,000. You could basically get a residence visa if you invested $250,000 into a business that employed five Australians uh, you could get a residence visa for as long as you had the business and employed those five people, you got to be a resident and stay in Australia. And then after a certain period of time, you could apply to be a uh, citizen. And so it was like your your green card for uh, Australia because of that. But anyway, this this company purchased the business and they they their marketing was, let's just say it was very professional. Let's, let, let's not be disparaging. Let's just say it was very, very professional marketing and they hated all of our marketing because it was it was kind of fugly and it really you know it was kind of jokey and it kind of played on this oh you know you're going to get more money for your business because you're going to sell it to a palm yeah and all those kind of great things that australians have about you know a little bit of a uh, our humor is very very unique mm. around the world mm. you know. <laughs> so uh and so they they changed everything like literally everything they changed in the business and it of course, it, it didn't work after that because the whole premise of the business was built around understanding who our marketplace is, why they want to get out of their businesses. And we, uh, as an ex-restaurateur, I knew um, why they would want to get out of their businesses. I could speak to them directly yeah. in such a way. And so, yeah, they changed everything and then closed it uh, 18 months later. So, Wow, gosh, that was yeah. a... Uh... A short, a short post-completion life for uh, yes, the new it owners. Did do very well. Goodness gracious! I, goodness I gracious. did think about buying it off them, but by that point, I'd moved on and I was selling. So I was, I was doing something else. Yeah, so and didn't. and so that was your foray into business broking. Did you um, did you ever think of coming back into uh, business sales again after af- after that foray? No, I didn't. Um, but, but I have subsequently um, purchased and sold a number of businesses. And it's always something that I look to do whenever I start a new endeavor to start with that end goal in mind. You learn very, very quickly when, when you analyze a lot of different businesses from a, from a sales point of view. You learn very quickly what sells and what doesn't sell and how to structure these businesses to make them look great from a sales perspective. And so, you know, if you've got business brokers that listen to that, they will know what I'm ex- exactly what I'm talking about. Oftentimes, our brokers would go in and, um, you know, 
th- there was cash coming into the business that couldn't be accounted for. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, we put a thousand dollars a week on the books, and the other two thousand dollars a week just goes under the table. <laughs> well, that's great, but how do we prove that? How do we prove that? So that sort of thing, you know. So you, you learn pretty quickly how to structure them with if you've got your eye on selling them. And, and it's not right to sell all businesses. That's not how you should do all businesses. But those of you those of them that you are looking to exit, then you have to set them up a certain way. Mm, okay. And I, I guess, so So, firstly, um, I'd just like to go back a little bit in our discussion where you were talking about your first business that you then sold. Do you remember at the time, I'm always interested in discussing with people with, with your very first business that you bought and sold, what are the differences between the way you approached building and then selling that first business to how you evolved your approach over time as you, you know, became uh, more uh, experienced in in the mode of building and then selling a business? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I think that the the big difference has been the systemization of the businesses. So I went to see a guy who you would have definitely heard of called Michael Gerber speak. And it was on the back of a, a really good friend of mine uh, giving me a book called The E-Myth. And uh, I read The E-Myth and, you know, it's a wonderful treatise on building a proper business. It's also a great personal development treatise as well. But the surface of it is this great kind of um, how you actually structure a business. So it's a business, not a job. And so that was really formative in my thinking. And I uh, approached business systemization with a zeal after that. Uh, so I would say that the, the big fundamental differences were that I had begun to understand uh, all about training staff through systems. And as a, as a knock-on effect of that, you also build a business that is then sellable as an entity rather than somebody buying themselves into a job that you're actually walking into something that you can sell as a business, something that's systemized, something that you've got a team in place that really know what they're doing, that doesn't rely upon uh, me as the owner. It kind of runs itself. It, well, it does run itself. That's, that ought to be what you're looking to do. So that was the, really, that was the big things that I learned about, about them. And that's been a very, very slow ongoing process to to put that into a into a strategy into a philosophy that I can apply systematically into the businesses that I build and uh, I certainly don't get it right every single time but the times I do get it right uh, it seems to it seems to go it seems to go well you know like all entrepreneurs I've had my fair share of failures and my fair share of successes uh, but to a T, all of my failures, I can attribute them to poor systemization uh, of the businesses. Uh, to a T, without a doubt. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I've said it a few times um, in this podcast in previous episodes, but I absolutely believe that um, a business that is the most saleable is also a business that can be the most fun to run in any event, you know, because that generally what makes a business most saleable is the implementation of systems um, and in, in a way that is profitable because, of course, you require that um, mostly, unless you're a tech business. Um, <laughs> but uh, <Yeah. laughs> generally speaking, profitable. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. What's your churn rate? Oh, you know, it's only a million dollars a week. And what's your revenue? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but I guess tech businesses are a whole new uh, podcast episode. But but totally do. Um, coming back, I'd be really interested to hear on – uh, a, a bit about what you think the most successful sale is that you've had. Well, that, I, I, that's a great question, and I, I would my, usually my most successful is the last one I've just done. So let me tell you about that one. <laughs> uh, so the we just did a sale of a Amazon business. So one of the things that I do a lot now is I build Amazon businesses and uh, build brands around these great Amazon businesses, and then we, we sell them on. And that typically takes 
anywhere from 18 months to two years from conception to to exit uh, and we've begun to put together a strategic step-by-step -step plan to do that that has so far yielded great success not only you know with with exiting businesses but also just with building them in general and there seems to be a set step-by-step -step thing that you can do that then yields a successful and profitable and saleable Amazon business at the end of it and um, there is a lot of interest in online businesses as any business broker who's listening to this would know there's a lot of interest in online in general and so it's a um, and, and I'm a big believer in doing as little work as possible for maximum return on that and one <laughs> of the easiest ways to get that is to is to ride on the coattails of societal trends and societal shifts and also to ride on the coattails of um, where the money's being spent by bigger companies. So an example of that is Amazon. So right now in Australia, Amazon is advertising like hell, uh, putting in the front page advertisements. They're doing bus stop advertising, news stop advertising, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're investing massively into Australia. So as an Amazon entrepreneur myself, I get to ride on the coattails of that. And I'm never going to be Jeff Bezos, $113 billion rich, but <laughs> there's enough to go around and I can make myself a very good living. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so we had a, and uh, you will definitely find this hilarious <laughs> because even when I, say, when I say it out loud to myself, it sounds crazy, but <laughs> we had a business that sold um, supplements for dogs and cats. Right. So what the hell does that mean? <laughs> right. Well, it's a big market, as, is as, it? <laughs> <laughs> as as pet owners uh we tend to and i know that you know i would certainly do this we tend to anthropomorphize our pets and that's shown when you look at any kind of pet advertising you can see even the pet advertising on tv where it's all for the sort of the dog and cat food well they'll talk about this pet food in the same way that um, a restaurant would talk about the food that you're going to eat. Oh, it's being prepared by chefs <laughs> who have painstakingly sweated over the details of your dog's dinner and made it a wonderful chicken cordon bleu casserole. Well, you know, do dogs really want to eat chicken cordon bleu? <laughs> of course not. They don't give a rat's about chicken. But as humans, yeah. that's what we want. And therefore, you are the ultimate person who, not your dog. Your dog is not buying the dog food. The person, I am buying the dog food for my dog. And so you must sell to me, not to the dog. And that's, that's a, very in, a very good insight for any marketing endeavor. You've got to sell to the right person. So again, looking at data, we looked at the evolution of a given marketplace. So if you take supplements, for instance, well, supplements back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, they start off at one particular um, point of difference in their given marketplace. And usually back then, it was just vitamins and mineral supplements, 13 vitamins, 14 minerals, and that's what you would buy. And everybody would buy the same vitamins and minerals. Well, over time, what happens is, as people see that that's a competitive and money-making opportunity, other entrepreneurs join in that melee and competition happens. And so what needs to happen is somebody needs to differentiate their offering. And what they will ordinarily do is the second level of differentiation for vitamins and minerals is uh, vitamins for men, vitamins for women. And now if you're a guy, well, you can't just buy any old vitamins. You must buy the vitamins and minerals for men. And if you're a lady, then you must buy the vitamins and minerals for being a lady. And so the market has split and differentiated. What happens then? More people join in the marketplace. And so that differentiation happens again. And so what happens next? Well, you've got uh, vitamins and minerals for ladies over 50, vitamins and minerals for ladies who are thinking about getting pregnant. Vitamins and minerals for ladies who are pregnant. Vitamins and minerals for ladies who have just had their babies and on and on and on. So that sophistication in terms of the, of the marketplace grows. It gets deeper and deeper into different niches. So look at those things and the next level of all those things 
uh, is where the market then says, okay, we've sold what we can to the human population. <laughs> now let's sell it to the things that the humans <laughs> own. <laughs> Happens every time. <laughs> Happens every single time. Look at jewelry. Look at clothes. Yeah. Happens every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the next step, so that is then dogs, cats, iguanas, whatever it might be, they, of course, need their vitamins and minerals. And so I watched all that happen with the pets. I didn't watch it from the 50s. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> but I watched all that stuff happen and thought, okay, well, where is the current state of play with regards to vitamins and minerals for humans? What is the current state of play for those guys? And it was a move towards probiotics. And that had a an incredible amount of upswell. There was a lot of marketing being done by other people that I could tap into, that concept of riding on the coattails again. And um, probiotics was big business and big news. And that's important that you have that news, again, that you can tap into and utilize as an entrepreneur to get more leverage. So I thought to myself, well, given that probiotics is a very big thing, I wonder if there are any probiotics for dogs and uh and there wasn't and i thought well i wonder if anybody finds that their dogs have got gassy bums and they fart a lot <laughs> and there was because that's a, that's well, a that's symptom a, of yeah. ibs and <laughs> let's not get into that you get where i'm going with that I get, I'm there. yeah <laughs> so uh so i looked at i looked at that and went okay so here's the marketplace we've got a uh, marketplace that has now seen a trend for humans, probiotics. We've got a, a group of animal owners who believe that they've got a problem with their animals because their their dogs, you know, are gassy, uh, and therefore we need a cure for that. We need to to introduce something into the marketplace that is a cure for those things. And so we came up with a probiotic aimed at dogs and then subsequently cats as well and sold that starting on amazon.com. Um, we did very, very well with it and it made a lot of money for us. It, we got it to uh, $45,000 a month on that one particular product. And so from that, I then went, okay, well, is there another level to that? And there isn't really another level. So for me, it was always going to be. Oh, that's, I, I must say, that's actually good to hear. I was scared about where this was going to. Uh, okay. Where'd you take it, Ned? Where'd you take I couldn't see it myself. So where'd you take the next one? Um, so I said, okay, well, I'm going to exit this business. And so we set that up specifically then to exit it. Um, and and we, we recently exited that business. I say recently, eight months ago, we sold that business. So and we sold it for typically Amazon businesses tend to sell for between 2.5 and three times EBIT, something like that, depending on the business and the level of systemization within them. But we actually got 4.5 times EBIT for that business based on work that we'd done outside of the, the business itself to put into, into, the, into the business two things. So we created a lot of blue sky for the person buying the business. And the blue sky in that particular case was, we set up some initial uh, tests uh, in different territories, because it's very easy to expand a online business into other marketplaces. So we had tested some marketing in other territories, the UK, Germany, to show that our product would sell in those territories and to show that there was a systematic way that they could get sales in those territories outside of the Amazon infrastructure uh, using Google AdWords as it was on Facebook marketing. And we set all that up for them. So that was one element to that. And then we also showed them within the, the territory, uh, which was the uh, Amazon.com, so the, the USA marketplace, we also showed them that we could go to more people within the USA marketplace by, by scaling out the existing marketing that we were doing. So what we're looking to do with any marketing endeavor is get it to the point where it becomes an investment. So for every dollar we're investing into this marketing, we get you know a buck 50 back, whatever it might be. So we always look to get to a situation where it can be a consistent, replicatable income stream that no longer relies on luck. It then becomes a, well, now we know 
up to a given point, of course, for every dollar we invest in, we're going to make a buck 50 back and we'll do that deal all day long. That's how we kind of want to get these businesses to. So we had a lot of systems in place uh, and we had a lot of blue sky in place for them as well. And so we're able to get you know, significantly more money for it than we would have been able to. And it meant that we could sell it based upon not what the business was doing, because the business was doing well, it had very good margins, but on half of what we thought the business could do. So here's what the business is doing. 45,000. We know that we could probably get it to 90,000. So let's sell it based upon 60,000. And that's a good deal for you. And, and so that's what we're able to do because of that. So that's probably, it's not been my most profitable exit, but it's a fun, fun exit to do. And, uh, you know, I love doing those things where you're putting in place a whole raft of different things. You're wrapping a great business up in such a way that it's a, it's a no-brainer for the buyer. I mean, it's just a no-brainer. And for I think there is so much in what you have uh, just talked about right now. And, and many of our listeners probably won't know much about Amazon businesses as a whole, but, <laughs> but there's so many fundamental elements in what you've talked about. Um, you, know, you know, to our accountants out there, our brokers or our business owners who are building for sale, what, what you're really demonstrating here is the way that you took what is a good business, and it was a good business because it had systems and processes and it and you know it had good um you know profit levels but it, how you took that and then found a way to look at it from the buyer's perspective from the buyer's perspective in that you know how do you really capture the imagination of a buyer in terms of what this business could be for the future because i think quite often business owners forget that people are buying businesses for the opportunity that they can grow it into not just where it is at the moment nice. you know absolutely nice yeah very well said i couldn't agree more with that so i i and i think that's you know you've you've given what i think you know is quite a um a simple sort of uh you know considerations for people to sit sit there and think about their business or the businesses that they're advising on whether they're amazon businesses or not <laughs> How is it sure. that we can imagine the upside, where the value still is, and how can we prove how our current systems can be replicated to uh, provide that ongoing um, and increased upside for a buyer upon buying it? That's a really nice synopsis of that. That's, that's fantastic. The, the only thing I'd add to that, I think, is that uh, the, the ability to, to place yourself into the buyer's shoes is integral, I think, to maximizing value. And the, the big thing that I learned from the business brokerage that we had was that, yes, of course, the buyer wants to come in to a business that's already making money because he's got or she's got um, needs, fundamental needs at the base level, thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Well, the first thing he's got to work out for himself is, is this going to pay my bills? Is this going to feed my family? Is this going to give me what I need to live? So those are the first things that the business has to do for them. And that's where your P&L comes into it. Here's what the business is making right now. Well, does that meet everything I want to do? It does. Okay, great. Check. I'm good with that. But then moreover, they want to know that they can add their own value and they can get their own higher level of needs met by adding value to the business themselves and feeling pride in their ability to grow the business. Now, if you show them how easily they can grow the business, then you've checked that off for them too. And there's a the, the thing that we found, and I don't want to get too kind of psychology with you or anything like that. <laughs> but the thing we found is the more we can engineer into a business the ability for the business owner to feel good, yeah. the more we can do that, the more money we can sell the business for because it meets more and more of their needs, meets more and more of their needs. So we've, we've, we've engineered into these businesses the ability for the business, for the acquirer of the business to, you know, and I often think about it just from my own point of view, coming back into, into my home with my wife, for instance, if I can come back into my home with my wife and say, 
you know what, darling, this week's been really, really good. We've had a fantastic week. We've grown the business by whatever it may be. Let's go out for dinner. Let me treat you. And if I can engineer into a business that kind of thing, then that's a wonderful thing to be able to engineer in that people will pay for as well. That's a really good point. And I think often um, people who are involved um, quite regularly in um, sales and acquisitions transactions forget how much emotion there can be for the individuals who are both buying and selling the business. But, you know, particularly if they don't do it a lot, I think there is a lot of um, emotion that is forgotten about. So I, I think you've uh, I, I think you've picked up on it really well. I, and I love that you, you know this is something that you've integrated in your way of uh, building a business ready for sale. Well, that's a wrap for part one of this two part series with serial entrepreneur Neil Asher. Now you know what I mean by serial entrepreneur, right? In this episode, Neil and I talked about the sorts of things a business owners ought to consider in building a saleable business that yields the best results at sale. Firstly, it's absolutely important that you set up good and profitable systems that allow you to run a business as a business and not as a job. As I mentioned earlier, indeed, the most saleable businesses are those which are the easiest and most fun to run because it's a business that's able to run without having the owner be part of every every single decision that needs to be made. Secondly, pay attention to societal trends and shifts and look at where big companies like Amazon, for example, are spending their money because there you'll find great opportunities to develop your own niche in the market and differentiate your business, which of course makes an attractive business at sale. Thirdly, capture the imagination of potential buyers by showing them how easily they can grow the business into the future. This goes back to the concept of looking at it from the buyer's perspective. And it's definitely something that we've highlighted time and time again on this podcast. Engineering a sale which makes the acquirer feel good about and proud about it being his purchase is definitely integral to getting the best value for your business at sale. Well, I hope you found this episode helpful. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe to The Deal Room Podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast player. And if you're already one of our subscribers, thank you. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So please leave us a review. This helps us reach more people. Now, please join us again next week for part two of this two-part series with Neil. In part two, we talk about an instructive sales experience in considering the timing of a sale. We also drill into Neil's encounters with accountants and brokers, and he gives some really great tips on what business owners ought to look for when choosing the right advisor to assist them in their business sale. But he also provides a lot of interesting and excellent advice from our accountants and brokers and M&A advisors who are working in the M&A space. So for all of this and more, listen in to the next episode in our series, in our discussion with Neil Asher. But for now, that's it. Thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oakey and the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.